Good morning, everyone. This is the House Healthcare Committee. It's Thursday, April 22nd at 9 a.m. And this morning, we're going to spend the entire morning uh, putting attention on the issue of children, children and youth mental health, and particularly uh, prompting our attention this morning is what we understand is the significant number of young people, children, uh, continuing to wait in emergency departments of hospitals seeking mental health treatment. So I, I'm just going to uh, say a couple brief words and that is that we need to understand, we need to understand the situation. Uh, we need to understand what's happening. Uh, we also need to look for solutions. Uh, we need to look both in the short term and in the long term. And I welcome uh, any and all of our witnesses to engage with us in both understanding the situation and looking for uh, resolution. Uh, I will just say personally, uh, earlier in the session, one of the hopes that I had wanted to put forward was uh, to pose this question. What is it that we would need to do to never have another child or young person wait in an emergency room for treat mental health treatment? And I think that that is, that is not just aspirational, but it should be really our goal. It should be our goal for all Vermonters, but particularly uh, for young people. So let's, uh, we, we, have, we have a very full agenda and I know that, and I will first start by thanking Representative Donahue for helping to organize uh, the witness list this morning. And I understand that witnesses have been given a time frame within which to speak and hopefully allow for some questions. And I'm gonna to need to ask committee members to also participate in helping us as we listen and ask questions to help us manage our time because we wanna hear from all the witnesses. And if you look on the, I think it's posted on our, on the uh, agenda. So you should be able to, you should be able to see who all is uh, in line to be heard. We will do our best to take a short break uh, mid morning because we all need that. Uh, but with that, I'd like to again, uh, get started. Uh, and our, we first invited uh, three folks who are working uh, with the Department of Mental Health. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, in introducing uh, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox. And uh, Fox, I'll have you introduce the other uh, colleagues who are with you here this morning. Uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, for the record, uh, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, and to your point, Chair Lippert, uh, since there are a significant number of uh, witnesses today and a, and a fairly limited amount of time and a lot of information to discuss, I will not take up too much time. Uh, I would like to introduce with me today that we'll be doing uh, uh, the bulk of, of our presentation this morning, uh, but also here uh, to be able to answer questions and, and provide additional information is uh, Laurel Omlin our uh, director of the Children and Family Unit at DMH, as well as uh, Dr. David Ratu, the medical director of our Children and Family Unit. Um, so I will actually at this time turn it over to Laurel uh, to take over uh, for our, our presentation. Thank you, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Fox. Um, good morning, I'm Laurel Oland, director of the Child Adolescent Family Unit at the Department of Mental Health. I do have a PowerPoint to share so if you um, bear with me one moment, I will start that. Thank you for the permission to do so. Can you all now see my screen? Yes. Okay. So we have been worried about the rising uh, needs of children and youth for several years um, and the pressures on the system, including, sorry, if that's interfering, I'm just trying to move things around here. Can you still see the screen okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've been cons concerned about the rising needs for children for, for several years, including the increased pressures on our whole system and the increased use of emergency departments to meet their mental health needs. We've been seeing increases in depression, anxiety, suicidal concerns, especially among our LGBTQ youth and black indigenous and youth of color. Um, these concerns have increased as youth have been struggling with the social isolation following the health and as they're following the health precautions in response to the pandemic. Unfortunately, emergency departments have become a point of contact for children and youth having mental health crises. 
The increased use of emergency departments has been primarily among youth who are waiting on voluntary status as, as opposed to involuntary status. And we'll show some data um, related to that in a little bit. But we also know emergency departments are not the appropriate setting to be treating youth psychiatric needs, yet youth may board for hours or even days in emergency departments until viable plans can be enacted. We know this is difficult for the youth, it's difficult for their families, and it's difficult for the providers. This isn't in line with our systems values, and it's been an area that we've been working to address with our system partners. But it hadn't reached the level of the immediate, immediate urgency that we're seeing uh, currently. We're, we're aware that even during a pandemic, when overall emergency department visits have declined, children and youth are going to emergency departments for mental health concerns, and they're going at higher numbers than we've seen before. And again, we'll, we'll show some of that data. So this is the pre-pandemic rates that we were seeing. Um, this shows the rates of uh, pediatric mental health diagnoses, diagnostic codes and emergency department claims. And it's shown by sex and year. Um, and so you can see a bit of the trajectory. Um, we know that female uh, youth, children and youth have higher rates of claims with a mental health diagnosis per 1000 emergency department claims compared to males. And we also understand that about 86% of all of these youth had public insurance and about 14% had commercial insurance. We also understand that while individual children ages 11 to 17 years old comprise about 40% of the overall child population in Vermont, they account for about 80% of the emergency department use for mental health related concerns. And those concerns have to do with things around suicidal ideation attempts or intentional self-injury, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, trauma and stress-related disorders, and other disruptive or impulsive um, control and conduct disorders. And then this shows um, the context both pre and during the pandemic. And you can see the higher numbers of children who are waiting um, were those who were waiting on voluntary status, um, as seen in the orange line compared to the children who were on involuntary or emergency exam EE status, which is the blue line. And this is from um, fiscal year 19 through April of 2021. This slide shows both the total um, each month and the average wait time. So as I said, even during a pandemic when overall use of emergency departments had declined, they're still going, youth are still going there for mental health concerns. And you can see that in the green line and the dotted trend line. And the wait times here have also been on the rise, which you can see in the blue line and the dotted line that uh, with the blue line, that's the average wait time. And we know that with an average, sometimes those can be driven up by a few individuals who have uh, significantly longer wait times, but the numbers and, and the, in general, the weights are still um, of concern to us. Hi, this is David. If I could just chime in uh, one point on this graph. Sure. Um, you'll see that in, in uh, 2019, uh, th there are seasonal variations to the number of kids who tend to come uh, into emergency departments. And you can see that there was a similar spike um, in 2019. We're at, at almost exactly the same point of the year right now. So I think we share, um, Representative Lippert, in your, in your sentiment that we don't want any kids with extended waits in the ED, but I just wanted to point out what we hope will be a, a hopeful sign, which is that there is, there is this surge that happens around this time of year and it tends to diminish um, um, in, you know, as school starts to wind down. Any idea what happens? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I'm wondering if any, either of you have any particular- Yeah, uh, um, it's a great question. Why why the surge? I think it, it, people talk about two things. One, it being related to school. People just, kids sort of feeling like the school is a long year and they kind of run out of gas. Um, secondly, there may be actually some seasonal variation in terms of mood and depression. There are actually some, I don't, won't go into it, but there's some interesting studies from Australia that kind of show the flip of this, uh, this graph. So um, there may be a seasonal component as well. As spring hits. 
Um, we also see it in other uh, requests for other uh, higher levels of care as well. So it's, it is something that we have noted over time and we see it in the inpatient trends um, over the years, even pre-pandemic. But it's, it's still of concern for us, yes. Can I, can I ask one question? Uh, and this is based on contact that uh, several of us had over the past year with uh, staff at uh, Spectrum Youth and Family Services. So we're talking here, I think the numbers here are children 11 through 17, is that right? At least that was the data. These that are all like, children, yeah. but, excuse me, sorry. These are all but, children, but about 80% are the 11 to 17. Okay, so what is the upper age range that this data includes? Because I think one of the questions as well is transition on what some people refer to as transitioning youth uh, who actually are uh, in their late teens very late teens and uh, that don't necessarily, or the question is, do they get captured in this data because there's been concern about emergency room response to uh, youth, uh, runaway youth, homeless youth, who uh, in this instance, Spectrum Youth and Family Services has referred to emergency services. I'm wondering if those are captured in this data. Yes. I believe that this data is for children, meaning under the age of 18. The um, 18 and over data, I believe, are captured with our adult um, tracking in the ED use. Um, but we are, we've also had conversations with Spectrum and share those concerns for the transition age youth. So it, it is a, a population that I think across our department, um, we are aware of and, and are um, looking to see how we can um, continue to address those concerns as well. Because yeah. psychiatric units kind of have an 18 cutoff so, um, so there may be a lot of transition age youth coming into the ED, but they have more options in terms of where they can go for um, if they need a hospital than do kids under 18. The one other thing I would note with this data is that <clears throat> um, it is only for, with the voluntary youth, it only includes those youth who are Medicaid enrolled. So we don't necessarily have data for all youth in Vermont. I think we've been, um, some hospitals may report youth who are on voluntary status, um, but many do not. And so we need to, who are not Medicaid enrolled, um, but they are all required to submit data for uh, involuntary youth regardless of um, coverage. So what that indicates to me is that, as you can see, there's a spike or an increase happening from January forward. Um, but in general, these numbers, are of concern and, and it might be somewhat un underrepresented. And, and again, if I may, I'm, I caution our members from asking questions, but I'm looking at this and I'm having to translate in my head the wait time in hours to days. I'm going, oh, well, day is 24 hours. And if it kind of start my way up the side here, we're talking the average is days. Yes. So that's, that's and that doesn't account for the outliers. So that's, 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 that's a pretty significant wait time. Correct. So we started to get into this a little bit, but why the upward trend? Um, we know that, as David talked about, there are some seasonal um, demands. Um, we also know that, again, given that highest uh, age group of the 12 to 17 year olds, <clears throat> they've largely been in either remote or hybrid school and the social isolation is really, I, I believe, impacting um, their, their mental health. Um, and so we know also that they've been struggling with increased anxiety, um, with mood disorders, as I talked about, suicidal concerns pre-COVID. And so the pandemic has exacerbated what existing mental health concerns there may have been. And, and um, also we understand is leading to some new concerns in other youth. Um, the other aspect of this is that provision of community mental health service in this past year hasn't been business as usual um, because of the pandemic. It, it has certainly, um, our providers have, um, done a tremendous job in uh, switching very rapidly to telehealth and ensuring that they are still connecting with youth. Um, but we just need to acknowledge that it is different. The workforce has been impacted. Um, and so that is also a contributing component. And I think lastly, just to say that it's unclear if this level of urgency is any trend or if it's temporary, um, given where we are currently with the pandemic. And that's something that we'll, we just need to continue to keep an eye on. Yeah, 
I know the analogy gets a little worn out, but in some ways, you know, the term perfect storm, I think may apply here when you put these three, three different things together. So the other components to that perfect storm, as I was uh, noting, is, is the impact on our capacity in general. And so this slide um, shows some of the current bed closures, and we've been seeing these numbers. They've fluctuated somewhat, but we've been running at about 70% capacity with our inpatient units and our um, hospital diversion and crisis stabilization programs. So um, I can say that the closures at Broadway Retreat have fluctuated slightly over the past four months. Um, and these are due primarily to staffing vacancies. Um, they're also trying to manage acuity on each unit. As you know, the Brattleboro Retreat is the only inpatient um, facility in Vermont um, for children to access, especially if they're on uh, involuntary status. And so they don't have other options for shifting groupings within a milieu. So they're trying to manage both uh, reduced staffing and, and vacancies um, as well as acuity. We know with NFI North, um, their closures are due to space limitations in order to follow COVID precautions. Um, they're very much interested in being able to reopen their beds. Um, and that's something we'll talk about a little bit later. With NFI South, their closures are primarily due to staff vacancies. Um, they've been, uh, as everyone in our system has been trying to recruit to fill those. Um, and just as a reminder of that program in the Brattleboro region, uh, of NFI hospital diversion just came online a couple of years ago. And it was it came online as an attempt to help uh, alleviate some of our systems needs. And then the Howard Center Crisis Stabilization Program has remained at full capacity uh, during this period. They have not had bed closures. The other thing to note is that we've been working closely with um, CVPH, uh, Champlain Valley uh, Physicians Hospital in New York. And we've connected um, with them and with our dozen agency emergency services teams to talk about how um, their inpatient hospital could serve Vermont youth. Um, of course, they could only serve youth who are on voluntary status because we can't have uh, youth on involuntary stat status traveling out of state. Um, but we've really appreciated that partnership um, with them and, and with their medical director. And we have been seeing some increase in uh, their ability to serve uh, Vermont youth. So we wanna continue to maintain that. And of course, there are some other inpatient um, hospitals that are Vermont youth access in some of the other states as well, but not at the level that we um, are doing with CBPH. So really, uh, if we could get these closed beds back online, that, that would reduce some of the um, pressures within our system. And that's an area that we want to continue to be um, focused on. So this was um, a visual of our system flow. And uh, it also, I wanna show where some of the pressure points are that we're talking about, as well as areas for potential and uh, planned projects and interventions. So I think, you know, we've, we've certainly acknowledged that there, there are significant workforce challenges um, across our system and, and at different levels of care within our system. So this is impacting the Brattleboro inpatient units, it's impacting our hospital diversion program, and it's also impacting our community-based system and their ability um, to truly meet the need um, locally as well. I think you've heard from our community providers about the number of vacancies that they are experiencing, as well as the increased demand um, for their services. So when that system experiences capacity pressures, it puts pressure on some of the um, further downstream more intensive levels of care. So it can um, put pressure towards the residential programming, towards uh, crisis beds and towards our inpatient. And now we're seeing also uh, significant more increased pressure in our emergency departments. It can also tend to pull resources from upstream promotion prevention activities um, when we have uh, pressures within that community-based system. And that's really a concern for, for our longer term uh, system. We also have some residential um, pressures. We've had some closures of residential programs in Vermont, um, as well as over the past decade, so that um, we have more limitations there. There is also reduced bed capacity due to COVID in some of our Vermont um, programs, as well as programs that AHS uses across New England. And again, this isn't just um, an experience that DMH is, is challenged by. It's also uh, challenging our uh, sister departments at uh, Department for Children and Families family services and development disability services. I like so, this graph because, you know, I think when you hear about kids being stuck in the ED, you immediately go to the ED, you go to admissions to hospitals, but 
we really try to take a broad view of the entire flow. And, and it's just to remember that, for instance, if you don't have hospital discharges, you don't have hospital admissions. And so there are a lot of different places where you can get bottlenecks that affect the entire, entire system. That's absolutely true. We've had youth also ready to transition from a higher level of care to something else and had to have that delayed because the next phase was also delayed. It, it is a bit of a domino effect. So it, there is a, a system flow concern here um, where COVID is playing a role in it and our workforce is, is playing a role in it as well. So some of the things that we think can help um, address this, we wanna continue to focus around our school mental health as an essential component of education's recovery planning. We wanna ensure that there are supports in place for uh, children, youth, and their families, as well as educators as they um, prepare to transition back to in-person learning. And then we also believe that um, enhancing uh, mobile response and stabilization services at, in the community level can um, help address some of this. And, and that's the next piece that we'll talk about. So I know from talking um, with my counterparts in other states that we're not alone in all these challenges that I've just been discussing, they're definitely felt around our country. And I know that also doesn't ease our particular burden and challenge, it just puts it in context. Um, the workforce challenges, the children waiting in emergency departments, the um, need to strengthen our community-based um, approaches and system are, are shared across our country. And I think one of the, um, main areas of focus right now that I'm seeing, again, in, in other states and, and with some of our national um, technical assistance folks, is really talking about what does make up an effective crisis continuum of care, um, and one that can address upstream as well as immediate diversion options. So that's described, a, a crisis continuum of care can be described as having that strong community-based system of care, including community wraparound services. It should include a crisis call center, um, and we know we're working towards the 988 um, in our country and in our state. It also includes a mobile response and stabilization service, such as what we're proposing um, for the Rutland pilot. Um, it includes emergency services crisis screeners. It can include urgent care centers for mental health, like what you might hear later around the um, UCS PUC program, the Psychiatric Urgent Care for Kids. And it can include crisis stabilization, hospital diversion programs, as well as inpatient care. So ideally, <laughs> You didn't hear me mention that this includes emergency departments or, or a police response. Um, so we, we want to not have those be a part of our um, intentional crisis response for mental health needs. For these to really be last resort or, or not even part of the picture, we need a more robust and high quality continuum of crisis services. And for kids, we need one that's tailored for the developmental needs um, of, of children and their families and, and distinct from systems that might be designed for adults. So we do believe Vermont could benefit from developing, um, enhancing a mobile response stabilization service. And uh, that's why we've been looking to uh, test that out in a pilot in Rutland. We anticipate that it could have impacts on outcomes such as those listed here. Um, and we recognize that COVID is having an impact on children and youth such that mental health concerns and the need for supports are on the increase. So we might not reduce um, prior use or spending, but our hope is that we would at least bend the curve on what the alternative trajectory might have been and avert um, unnecessary out-of-home intervention or going to emergency departments or use of higher levels of care. And these outcomes have been demonstrated in similar programs in other states. It's not just something we're aspir you know, not just aspirational for us. Thank you, David. Yes, and here are some examples. I'm not gonna um, walk through these, but you have them for reference in what other states have seen as they've implemented mobile response and stabilization services. So some of the short-term responses that we've been looking at to address the concern around children boarding and emergency departments. Um, we have been meeting every other week with uh, emergency department directors, with FOS, the retreat has um, joined us. And it is a, a problem solving, um, discussing what, what are the challenges, what are the potential um, solutions. Um, we've been talking about how to get those closed beds open. It's clearly a, a systemic workforce issue, um, but there might be some 
adjustments to, to guidance um, that I'll talk about in a minute that we're, we're hoping might alleviate some of those that are closed just due to um, COVID. Um, we know that UVM Medical Center added a child psychiatric consultation within their emergency department. This happened um, not because of these meetings, but they've been able to share that experience um, with other uh, emergency departments across our state to talk about what that impact has been. And then there's been some discussion about um, accepting youth who are waiting in a mental health crisis, accepting them onto general pediatric floors. And it sounds like a couple of hospitals um, are considering that as well. And that's been an approach that other states, um, David had, had understood other states have um, used that approach as well. It doesn't, it doesn't resolve the issue. It is just um, a change of, of seeing away from the emergency uh, department um, environment into a, a setting that is um, more pediatric uh, oriented. We've also um, been continuing to have conversations with our community mental health agencies, understanding what their um, workforce challenges are and what the limitations um, are related to COVID precautions and working um, with the health department to understand when can some of those um, approaches be adjusted. Um, we have had some continued um, focus around workforce development to ensure that those practices within communities are um, grounded in, in good evidence-based practices that can address anxiety, depression, suicidal concerns. Um, certainly some of our other projects uh, have been helpful with that. And then pre-COVID, we had also been having some uh, broad discussions across our system um, about the children's uh, crisis continuum. We had a community think tank. Um, we pulled together a, a multidisciplinary team um, with AHS and community partners to look at um, what's possible there and, and focusing in on the mobile response and stabilization services. We had some opportunities to learn from other states and, and put together the proposal that has been uh, discussed elsewhere. So we also know, um, you know, I've been in conversation with uh, the NFI uh, executive director about the hospital diversion beds and closures and what's contributing to that. These programs want to open the beds that are currently closed. Um, I think particularly for the NFI North um, program where their closure is due to um, space issues related to COVID precautions. That's an area where we wanna to continue to work with um, Department of Health to understand how can we shift that um, as vaccinations increase and the governor's Vermont forward plan is enacted. So that could help eliminate some of those. Um, within hospital diversion as well as potentially in residential programs that have had reduced capacity um, due to those that guidance. And that can help with some of that system flow that we talked about. I mentioned already the collaboration with CVPH in New York, where we really do value that partnership and we're continuing to um, communicate with them about what are some of the barriers or challenges that are um, designated agency emergency services teams have experienced in trying to get youth um, accepted into that program. And uh, they've been great, CVPH has been great in thinking through and, and making some adjustments to, to help with that. But again, it's a more limited um, population that, that is able to go there. And then there has been extensive um, AHS interagency work. We have care managers or similar roles across family services, DMH and uh, development disability services working every day around these uh, situations where um, youth are waiting in emergency departments or ready to transition from another level of care and trying to work through the complicated um, um, components to what are those barriers and, and trying to address those. So that is um, ongoing daily uh, work of our teams across DMH and, and the other HS departments. And then for midterm um, responses, we, we really do um, want to partner closely with Agency of Education on their um, recovery planning. We know that it needs to include um, supports to address social, emotional and mental health needs of students as well as of educators um, as they prepare to reemerge and, and uh, open up or get back into in-person learning more full time, especially for the older kids. Um, we also know summer is an important component of this. It's, it can be a, a helpful transition to work in towards some of those um, re-emerging, getting back into some routines and, and connecting with friends in a fun, accessible way. And that can help prepare students and families for the return um, into school as well. 
we also have the opportunity to consider additional capacity across our continuum um, and especially within our community mental health agencies. Um, again, our, our proposal around mobile response is one component of that. We have an opportunity under ARPA with some of the um, enhanced FMAP options for new programs for mobile crisis um, services that we want to continue to explore. Um, and we're committed to ensuring that other federal funding that's directed to DMH for community mental health services is implemented in a targeted and strategic um, manner. And then lastly, we will be focusing on workforce recruitment efforts. Um, we'll be pulling together a task force to look at a, a five-year strategy to strengthen the workforce, hoping that that would include partnerships with higher ed, looking at licensure reciprocity and other strategies um, to recruit and retain a quality mental health workforce for our state. We need to be able to continue to respond to the lingering effects of the pandemic um, and that workforce is essential in helping us meet that goal. We want to be able to provide the right service at the right time for kids. Um, and so we, we know that that's a component of it as well. And I'll invite Fox or David to add any, any other aspects to that. I don't have anything to add, Laurel. I think that was really well done and comprehensive. So I think we're, um, I'm just available here for help answer any questions. Why don't we yeah, take I agree. Yeah, okay. Thank you going off screen so people can. So uh, let's we have about 10 minutes uh, available for committee questions or further comments. Uh, Representative Houghton. Thank you. It's more just a, a comment. One of the things I've talked about the last couple of years in this committee is the su success beyond six. So I was glad to see that in the medium term. And then seeing the data about the seasonality and how it seems to spike during the school year, I have felt um, quite frankly that there has not been an emphasis on the connection between what can happen with Department of Mental Health and the schools. Um, you know, I think this is a key place we should be spending a lot of time focused on. What more do we need to do in these schools to prevent the downstream effects? Um, and then the other question I have is on the bed capacity being offline, is that simply a COVID workforce issue or did we have those capacity issues or the bed closures prior to COVID? Thank you. So I can start oh, with the, oh, go ahead, David. I think, I, I think COVID has made it worse, but there have been bed closures and um, difficulties with capacity even before COVID. Uh, there can be a lot of reasons why, you know, a kid won't be accepted to, to Brattleboro um, based on acuity, based on the fact that they may know somebody on the unit. And so um, there are, are other barriers, including the, the, wor the workforce has, has been a, a tough one for a long time. And I would, I would just add that, you know, as around the bed capacity, I think, uh, you know, Dr. Ratu is, is accurate that it, it existed pre-pandemic, but it really was more based you know, one bed here, another bed here, uh, based on acuity of a unit uh, or some potential conflicts as, as uh, Dr. Ratu mentioned, uh, we didn't see pre-pandemic kind of the consistent uh, bed closures of three, four beds on the adolescent unit. I think, you know, right now we're looking at uh, four of the 18 beds uh, on the adolescent, uh, older adolescent unit at the retreat. Uh, have been fairly consistently closed. And that is COVID uh, related uh, staffing uh, related uh, issues. Um, so, and that's not just a retreat issue, that's everywhere. We have, you know, beds offline throughout our entire system, uh, pretty much every hospital, including the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Uh, staffing is just, it's been just a really very difficult time right now uh, in, in all places. So it's, I just wanna be clear that it's not just a, a retreat issue, that it's, a, it's systemic, uh, the, the staffing issues and the impact on uh, bed capacity. Thank you. And I, I, if I can just make one last comment, I would urge you to have that school connection with the, in the short-term responses if at all possible. Thank you. Representative Black, and then Representative uh, Peterson and Burroughs, and we, uh, we have, 10 minutes max, so we can hear from our other presenters. So. I'm, just, I'm just wondering um, what our capacity is in the state for non-acute care, sort of um, psychiatric child, psych psychiatric care, psychiatric nurse practitioner. 
I'm wondering if a, a lot of the people we're talking about here, the kids we're talking about, have been unable to access in an outpatient setting, and then it gets to the crisis point. I'm, I'm wondering if we have a shortage also in that. I do believe that is a contributor. Um, we have a, a number of vacancies across our community mental health system for providing that outreach and in-home and even school-based. We, we have providers who are doing it, but between vacancies and then the increased demand, it, that there is a pressure there. Um, and then we do have um, some gaps also in child psychiatry, although we have partnership with UVM in a fellowship program to, to try to um, you know, have child psychiatrists trained under that. And we hope that they will uh, stay in Vermont. Um, some years we are successful in that and other years they, they have other um, plans elsewhere, but it's an important component to our system to ensure that we do have effective child psychiatry. Another way that we've been trying to address that um, gap, if there isn't a, a child psychiatrist in a particular region, is to have them be, that region be able to access for child psych psychiatric consultation through UVM and through some other um, folks that, that we are trying to support to provide that consultation, as well as for primary care um, physicians um, and for child welfare um, social workers so that there can be access to really getting questions answered around um, what's going on for a youth, uh, what is the best approach to care. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Peterson and Representative Burris. Yes, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for your presentation. Um, and, and please excuse my ignorance on some of this because uh, I'm in new water here. Um, the, the statue show are for kids coming in for care, correct? Children 11 to 17 coming in for care. Um, ignore the ring in the background, we'll get to that later. Um, I'm wondering how many of those children actually have a problem versus some that might, you know, with kids, there could be things where it isn't really that big of a deal. Please go home and you'll be all right. Uh, is there, uh, do, does every child that come in, comes in for a mental health issue actually have a mental health issue? I'm just trying to get to that. So I think, you know, mental health is a continuum, right? And I think for all of us, we can have um, increased mental health needs and then increased mental wellness. I think what part of the way I can answer your question is for children who are coming to emergency departments with a mental health need, um, are, are they all going and waiting for an inpatient stay? The answer to that is no. Um, that's why we have crisis beds so that children who might not have as acute of a, a crisis need could go to a lower um, level of care, if you will, a, a less um, intensive setting. And then we have some youth who, are, who go to emergency departments and wait, and then the crisis abates. You know, we know for kids that sometimes crisis can get really intense and then it, it can be um, reduced. And so with that, there is our, again, our designated agency emergency services teams are really trying to evaluate the youth and determine what is the best plan. And if they can put together a crisis plan that can support them back in the community, that's their first goal. Um, if they need a more intensive level of service then they're pursuing that. And unfortunately that's where there's, there tend to be longer waits. But I would add that if, if there's a kid who's being listed as someone who is waiting for an extended time in an ED, it's a big deal. It's, that means that there's a safety concern, that there is a real concern that this child or, or youth is in danger to themselves or other. It's not, a, it's not a kid just having a temper tantrum. Okay, and, and along with that, doctor, um, when you say waiting in ED, are they physically waiting there all those hours? They are. They are. So if somebody, somebody could, I mean, be there for, just wait there for a couple of days and they sleep in the room. Yeah. I mean, it's in, in regular, you know, some of the emergency departments have now tailored rooms to be different than your typical ED room. So there's not all, you know, the tubes and equipment that may be in there, but it's one of the rooms in the ED and the parent is there as much as they can. And there's often a, um, a mental health technician who's sitting next to the room all the time with them too. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Representative Burroughs, and then uh, there's a moment I'd like to add one thing, but Representative Burroughs. 
Thank you. Thank you for your, your uh, testimony this morning and thank you for taking my question. Um, I wondered uh, what whole family measures are being put in place to support children as well as their families? So I think that's um, a great question because we're talking about children waiting, but we know that their whole family is impacted when, when there's a mental health crisis and especially if they're waiting in an emergency department. So we have done some things that again, it feels like um, a, a small response to a bigger need. So we've developed some uh, brochures for families who, when you're in distress and, and in an emergency department to help them understand what they might be able to anticipate, um, who they could be talking with, um, just some informational. We had um, our Vermont Federation of Families organization help us uh, design something that was oriented for families to understand the process and to be able to capture some information as they're there. Um, we know that uh, ensuring that we have, again, that quality um, approach within communities is essential so that perhaps families feel like their needs are being met in a community setting, they don't need to go to emergency department. And that's where those, the pressures within our system um, are challenged. But we believe something like a mobile response uh, approach could enhance that. We also think that um, there are other practices around wraparound and enhancing some of our family-based um, interventions it is an essential component as well. David or Fox, if you wanna add. Mm -hmm. What happens when there's a when there's a family member who's in crisis, which causes an adolescent to be in crisis? What happens to the whole family? Are they treated separately? Are they treated together? What what kind of wraparound services are there? Typically, the emergency services team at a designated agency would be contacted, um, and they would evaluate what the situation is and then um, respond accordingly. If if they um, have the capacity, they, they might be able to go out and uh, intervene where the family's uh, distress is happening. I think more because there's been increased um, demands on those emergency services teams, it has become, uh, I think, efficient to, to meet at the emergency department and do that evaluation there. And I would, I would just add to that that you know, that's definitely not a preference that the recommendation is and, and that, you know, the way to engage with services is to go to the emergency department um, to, to connect with folks. I think there's some research that also supports that, you know, when, when evaluations, assessments and supports are provided in the emergency department, there's a higher, uh, higher outcome of, of uh, resulting in needs for higher levels of care as opposed to those services being provided in the home. Um, and I think as uh, uh, Laurel was, was talking about, you know, the emergency services teams would, you know, when the capacity does exist to go out, uh, they're assessing who's, who, who in the family is actually in crisis and then who's having kind of a secondary crisis as a result of that. Uh, and so it may be a coordination of efforts between uh, child and family services and adult services, uh, depending on how you know, how that situation uh, kind of is, is teased out. I think that's one of the roles of the mobile response uh, uh, system where you really have a team that's focused on, you know, a family defined emergency and addressing the family as a whole with one cohesive coordinated team uh, of professionals to, to go out. Uh, and so, you know, that's one of the the, the big impacts of that mobile response uh, type system as well. But you're, you're saying that the mobile response system is stressed at the moment. Uh, is there, is there a potential for two family members, an adult in crisis, a child in crisis, to both go to the emergency room, the adult be treated or, or dealt with um, within a few hours and the child remaining there for 60 or more hours? I think it depends on, on the outcome uh, of, of those assessments. If, if the, as you, in your example, if the, uh, the adult uh, is assessed and is able to uh, receive the necessary supports that, that will help them be, remain safe in the community, then that's what will happen. 
But if the youth remains unsafe and needs a higher level of care, um, then unless that bed is is readily available, then then yes, you're right. That youth may end up now waiting in the emergency department while you know the the adult or the parent may be staying there as a support, but not uh, waiting waiting for placement. So thank you. I, I'm going to suggest we move on because I think this issue is uh, perhaps can also be addressed by our next witness, uh, which is. Uh, Christian, is it Polcini? I'm not sure if I'm saying your name properly. Well, welcome. You are uh, saying my name correctly. Thank I'm you. Looking for you on the screen. There you are. You just flipped around. Uh, so uh, let me welcome you, ask you to introduce yourself. I understand that you are at UVMMC in the pediatric emergency medicine, and perhaps you can help us understand what role you and others may play. And I'm just gonna pose a question at the outset that I, I find myself thinking about when we've heard from the others that have just been talking, that I, isn't it, I, I'm concerned that, I've, I've spent time in emergency rooms uh, for myself and with family, and it's not a place you wanna spend a lot of time. Uh, and I'm concerned that the length of time that some young people are spending in fairly sterile environments, uh, in fact, environments that are not set up for mental health care, uh, actually could exacerbate the situation rather than uh, lend itself to it resolving. But uh, let me let me welcome you to comment broadly and then uh, if you are able to comment on that particular question, I'd welcome it as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman Lippert. You actually just stole the thunder of exactly what I was planning on saying, so I appreciate it. I think we're I think we're kind of on the same page. But uh, for the record, my name is Christian Bolcini. I'm a board certified pediatrician and pediatric emergency medicine physician at UVMMC and UVM Children's Hospital. Uh, I'm also a former middle school science teacher with a master's of education in secondary education and a formal public health professional with a master's in public health with a concentration on ma uh, maternal and child health. Uh, I recently moved from Pennsylvania where I can, go ahead. Go, thank you for being in Vermont. And you're now you tell me you're, you're moving from Pennsylvania. Yeah, I recently you. moved. Yeah, I recently moved from Pennsylvania where I did pediatrics residency at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and pediatric emergency medicine fellowship, which is actually a new specialty uh, for the most part in uh, available to kids in Vermont. Uh, and I did that fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, but I have some written testimony I completely intend on providing you at the end of this, as well as some data out of UVMMC. And I think it actually will address some of the issues you bring up, Chairman Lippert. Uh, I want to sincerely thank you all uh, for allowing me to provide testimony today, as well as for recognizing the importance of understanding the current state of our children's acute mental health care needs. I sincerely applaud your solution-oriented approach to address this issue with a sense of urgency, because as, as someone representing Vermont pediatricians through the American Academy of Pediatrics Vermont chapter, my emergency medicine colleagues at the UVMC and Children's Hospital, and as a father of three and community member, uh, I think a sense of urgency is needed for this issue. Uh, you've already been presented with uh, quite a bit of data, and I'll just say when I went to my uh, UVM uh, MMC shift yesterday in the ED, I should add to some of that data that there were five children waiting at least five days in the emergency department for an inpatient mental health placement. One of those children have been waiting two weeks. Uh, this is unfortunately becoming the norm in our emergency department. Uh, on my arrival, our shift is always 2 p.m. to midnight. Uh, I, I did want to emphasize, however, that this issue seemed to be, and I'm again, a, a new person in Vermont looking back on some data, not really a new issue. Uh, as uh, Laurel was highlighting some of the trends, but at least the trends that I've seen from UVMMC data is that from 2010 to 2019, uh, there was a three-fold increase in uh, the visits for ED visits for children and youth for primary mental health complaints. I will add as an emergency medicine provider, I think this should be said, we can't account and none of this data can account for the number of children, especially in that transition age you're talking about, who present to the emergency room with abdominal pain, chest pain. And what ends up happening is that we have a strong, you know, we always think of in, in pediatrics and in medicine in general, there's a strong mind body component. And some of those visits are certainly related to mental health during this pandemic and we won't be able to capture them. They, those, uh, to answer Representative Peterson's question, are usually not on the magnitude of the children waiting five days or more. Like uh, Dr. Ratu pointed out, those are usually very serious issues. 
but I don't think we're fully capturing the extent of what is going on, uh, certainly during the pandemic and, and probably even before. In that time from 2010 to 2019, the maximum length of stay in those years increased from 12 hours to 62 hours uh, for mental health complaints. So this data suggests that even pre-pandemic that an intervention for our youth was inevitably needed. So beyond these statistics, and I'm bl glad you brought it up, Chairman Lippert, uh, and what's particularly challenging in my setting is that we are extraordinarily fortunate at UVMMC to have a trained child psychiatrist who assesses these children every single day. Uh, this is not a resource that is shared around the state or even around the country, uh, notably at the critical access hospitals where a lot of these children end up boarding. Uh, we also have a host of social workers, case managers, nurses, physician assistants, ED technicians, child life colleagues, and parents and family who are doing their best every day to provide any sort of environment that's therapeutic for these children. Uh, and speaking with my P uh, emergency medicine colleagues and pediatrics colleagues around Vermont, they are experiencing the same even at critical access hospitals, like a well-intentioned group of people who care about children, witnessing children and adolescents being boarded for days, waiting for a more appropriate setting to address children's mental health needs. Uh, and I think the reality is, and you guys have already, several have already spoken to this, is that even in a resource rich environment such as we have at UVMMC, the ED is not an appropriate setting for children to get comprehensive acute mental health services. We've we have contributed a host of human resources to optimize what we have going far beyond expectations in many instances like in our ED. We have done this because watching children, you know, quote unquote, bored in the ED day after day, confined to their room, which is an additional thing, Chairman Lippert, uh, they yeah. actually cannot leave their room physically because it's not safe during the pandemic, is extraordinarily disheartening to all the individuals who lay witness this day by day. I, I should just point out as a pediatrician and father that children should be in school learning, children should be at home developing. And when needed, children should receive appropriate mental health services in the right setting at the right time to get back to the learning and developing that's so important for their lives. So this data that I've given, and Laurel actually did a fantastic job uh, giving to this group, uh, is really important in arriving at solutions to avert the crisis. Uh, my colleagues at the Department of Health, Department of Mental Health, and VAS uh, can certainly testify and provide the big picture data as expert. I feel it's my, my duty, however, uh, as a physician specializing in pediatric emergency medicine advocate for kids to mention these unmeasurable consequences of ED boarding of children with acute mental health issues. For example, we can't measure the trauma that we are inflicting on children who already have a history of trauma by holding them in an inappropriate therapeutic environment such as the ED. We can't measure the developmental consequences of boarding an elementary school-aged aggressive child for days in the ED. And really importantly, and I think looking upstream with all this, we're not gonna be able to measure the propagation of the mental health stigma we are normalizing in our society by making it clear that the child with a broken arm or fever waits in the ED for a few hours and the child with a mental health complaint waits there several days to weeks. And I think that's something we need to think about. Absolutely. As we know from a recent surge in high profile media stories, as well as some data presented earlier, across the nation, uh, there's a lot of focus on acute children's mental health issues. Uh, these tragedies are happening daily and will only increase in the wake of the isolation and lack of socialization with peers that most of the children have experienced during the pandemic, especially those who can't attend school, as Laurel mentioned, uh, and those participating in things like sports uh, that are strength building supportive activities that didn't happen over this past year. I'm proud to live here. I think Vermont, from what I've seen, it does a fantastic job of prioritizing kids and understands the needs for hearings like this uh, to avert further harm to kids, notably those with mental health care conditions. It's been well known in the pediatric community that 20% of kids in the US have been diagnosed with a behavioral mental health condition. That was in 2019 pre-pandemic, which is exponentially growing due to the COVID pandemic. It seems now is the time to assess a comprehensive and multifaceted approach to children's mental health in Vermont that includes both short-term measures to alleviate the current boarding crisis as well as longer-term interventions. And I won't go more into that because I think Laurel did a fantastic job and I agree with basically everything she said in terms of some of the interventional work that is there. Uh, as well as a former teacher, I certainly support any interaction with schools uh, that Representative Houghton uh, 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 also spoke to. So I, I know this situation will require investment, but the cost of not trying to provide these services to youth will 
certainly lead to greater economic challenges, which I'm sure you all understand. And most importantly, it's just devastating on a human level. Uh, these children are our next generation and having them experience the mental health stress that I see so many experiencing will affect the well-being of our children long after this pandemic for sure. So thank you for allowing me to speak today uh, on behalf of kids and I hope some of this was helpful and didn't add to just what was already had been said and uh, I look forward to any questions or concerns and again I'm happy to send these words that I spoke today as well as some additional data that I have. Well, I, I want to thank you uh, very much for uh, adding to this conversation this morning, uh, adding your knowledge and for uh, your personal willingness to take to move into this work uh, with the background that you're bringing. Uh, I, I'm just going to name one thing. I see Representative Goldman has a question. Uh, I, and I, I say this with appreciation for everyone we've heard from so far, but I'm, I'm thinking of the families. I'm thinking of the children. I'm thinking of people who are like for whom it's no it's no relief to hear that we're thinking about this at the legislature. They're in the emergency room with a child or a family situation and, and, and absolutely horrified that they're having to be there for days and days and days. And so the question I would pose, and, and I, I, I'm not looking for an immediate answer necessarily, but it's like, if we truly consider this, if we consider this truly an emergency situation Broadly, that children are waiting for days in our emergency rooms. What would we do? What 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 would it take for us to respond? And I'm not I'm not suggesting that anyone's not taking this seriously, but it does seem to me when we have children waiting literally on average three and four days for some type of real service, uh, it's it it, po it leaves me still with the question like. What would we mobilize? What could we mobilize that goes beyond what we're doing now? And I would just, you know, again, I say that with appreciation, not criticism, uh, for what it is that you all are doing on the front lines. It's, but it, it's, it's, it, yeah, thank you. I'm going to turn to Representative Goldman and, and, and I welcome others to respond along the way. And again, thank you so much uh, uh, for being here, Dr. Pochini. Representative Goldman. Thank you, Representative Lippert. I think your question is essential. Um, my question is, I'm trying to understand in a way what the denominator might, might be, which is how many children actually come into the ED with mental health issues that can be cared for, referred, uh, and, and I wanna understand what happens to the group that doesn't require admission. Um, and how many of those children are there compared to those that do require that level of care? Is there data sort of a what the whole denominator of children coming into EDs with mental health problems and their disposition? That's a great question. I believe that I have that. Uh, acute mental health needs are rising in some of this. Uh, I have the rates in terms of percentage of visits, uh, hours of care, as well as length of stay. Uh, with a Q. So, okay, uh, it, it appears as in from at least 2019, again, these are not updated to 2020 data, that there are around uh, 2,200 kids coming to the UVMMC ED alone. Uh, so I can't speak to other hospitals with that data. Obviously, we are probably the largest health system and uh, largest hospital where uh, the most kids in the state present to, uh, but 2,200 kids and uh, for those being admitted, I actually do not have that data, but that is an easy thing, honestly, for us to obtain. Uh, I don't know if anybody else on the call has that specific data sitting in front of them, but that would be something that I can follow up on and certainly send to this group as part of the data that I'm, I'm happy to send. And again, that's just UVMMC data. The denominator, I will tell you that the, what Laurel alluded to as well, just from a clinical standpoint, and this doesn't provide the statistic that you specifically asked for, is that the number of presentations that uh, go home uh, who are assessed by our, our crisis team who are fantastic and we love to work with them, it, it appears even in my first seven months here that the number of children who go home is less and less than the number of children who stay due to the acuity being higher. And I think the data of the length of stay in general speaks to the fact that the acuity has gotten higher in the last five years, especially, uh, you'll see in the data. And that reflects in the length of stay. As Dr. Ratu said, 
uh, the kids who stay for a lot of days are assessed by mental health professionals in the ED. And I would say it usually happens within, you know, 10 to 12 hours at the most that they're time to a mental health professional. And so they are deeming that it is serious enough for them to remain in the ED to either be assessed by the child psychiatrist who is in uh, in the morning, perhaps, or during the day, who also follows up and sees these kids every day. Uh, so I would just say that in our particular setting, with the five kids who are waiting for greater than several days, they are assessed by a child psychiatrist every day and deemed to be unsafe to leave the emergency room in a need of inpatient placement. So that's the highest level of care that we could provide somebody in the emergency room and we're already providing it. And we're still seeing these outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna to turn to my committee members. Uh, the queue is not always clear on my screen. Uh, I think maybe Representative Peterson and Representative Donahue, and then Representative yeah, Page. I, I think I was next, but I'll, yeah. I'll jump ahead of the other two. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, and, and doctor, thank you for your testimony. Um, you certainly have a very well-rounded background to say the very least. Uh, and I would recommend that uh, you leave Burlington and come down to the Rutland area. <laughs> one, one uh, person in the Rutland area. But, but seriously, in my opinion, we get no, not that we get nowhere, but, but we can find ways to fix the current problem. I think when we put our heads together, we'll find ways to reduce the uh, wait times and emergency rooms. We'll take care of kids. My concern is the root cause of all this. Take COVID out of it. Put COVID aside. What do you think? You're, you're a father, you're, you've been a teacher, and you're now a doctor. What, what do you see as some of the root causes of, of these issues with our children? It's very concerning. I'm a grandparent of 12 kids, and, and it's very concerning to me that, that kids are having these issues. Uh, and, and I want to get your perspective because you're very well-rounded. Thank you. Oh, you, you're going to make me nervous in front of my mental health colleagues who are uh, experts in this, uh, such as somebody like Dr. Ratu, who just wrote a book on parenting. So uh, <laughs> the, I would say the things that I have seen uh, in general is it's hard. I mean, I, I find that the stressors that kids are presented with uh, in modern times, uh, I don't want to just point to social media because some social media and some technology is, it can be healthy for kids in their interaction with it. Uh, but uh, I would say that the over, like the overwhelming stressors of just their regular environment has increased probably in the last few years. I don't, I think that there's plenty of people in the last 20 years who care about kids and are doing that, trying to do the right thing by kids and are also trying to adapt to the environment that their own kids are in, such as me at home. I remember, you know, putting COVID back into it. Uh, I was, I'm not sure I was the best father during that stretch of time uh, where I was home with my kids all the time, also trying to work full time on things like research and activities such as this that I feel passionate about. Uh, and I think that, uh, that things that support families in the best possible way probably will be helpful. So I, I mentioned things, what I did in, in childhood was sports. I just signed my child up for a musical theater summer camp. Like these things are very rich in Vermont. Child care is a huge issue. Uh, and we're, we're talking about upstream solutions that uh, are a much larger conversation, I think. And I'm, I'm not sure I'm exactly the best person to speak to this directly. But I do, I do know some colleagues that are, and I probably would call on their help if I'm going to try and answer that question holistically. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Page or Donahue, either go forward. Representative Page? Uh, yes, um, this probably, this, these questions probably apply to everybody. But um, do we know what our success rate is for treatment? What is the treatment uh, for these children um, what does that look like? And once these children reach age 18, what happens to them um, if their treatment continues on? I guess we'd open this up to any of the witnesses who we've heard from to this point. So from the department as well as uh, Dr. Polcini. Does anyone wanna step into this? 
Dr. Ritu or Laurel? I can uh, take a stab at it. So if you're asking about like what happens when they get to the hospital or when they get... Um, when they get to 18. Well, oh, when they get to 18, I thought... I'm, I'm sorry, pa Representative Page, speak for yourself. Yeah, please. That's quite all right, Chair. Um, what is our success rate in treating these children for one, for one item? Um, and what, what, I guess, how do you treat them? Do we, do we medicate them? Is that, is that what we call success uh, in the treatment? Um, and then also, if their treatment continues on, what happens after some of these children reach 18? But then. So, so treatment, you know, we generally really advocate for a very comprehensive model of treatment. Uh, medicines may or may not be part of it. Uh, certainly individual psychotherapy can be a big part of it for a lot of youth. Um, working with the families to help them often cope with very challenging behavior we think is really important. Uh, encouraging activities for kids that we know build healthy brains. Uh, so getting them, you know, exercising, getting them off eight hours of screens a day, you know, all those kinds of things. That's what we sort of call comprehensive treatment. And um, you can't always accomplish that in a short hospital stay, but we try to get the ball rolling um, when kids go in. Regarding your question at 18, it really depends on sort of where they are in the system. But like a, ch a child psychiatrist like me, we don't kick kids out at 18 and say, sorry, I can't see you anymore. So there can be continuity. We'll, we'll see people. I have a whole bunch of patients now in, my in their 20s because I've got no place to send them and they don't want to go anywhere. Um, in terms of the DA system, the community mental health system, there will sometimes be a transition from um, who's taking the lead on their services, who's their case manager, who is their so that there can be some transition that I think, frankly, we can probably do a better job making uh, more smoothly. And Laurel, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, I was just gonna say our, our children's mental health system does serve children up to the age of 22. So there is an overlap for that transition age um, period from 18 to 22, where it really depends on what they evaluate. What are the needs of the youth? Um, and is that need uh, most effectively effectively met through the children's system or is it met through the um, adult mental health system? So there are um, some intentional decisions that are made with the youth, with their family, if, if still connected um, about where to receive that care. And if they're still involved in school, that's another component of it um, where they might continue to receive uh, school-based mm -hmm. mental health. Representative Black. Having trouble unmuting, thanks. Um, I know this is a really simplistic question um, and it's not a long-term solution. I, I recognize that it, the problem is a lot deeper. I'm really struggling to understand how, like particularly the largest healthcare provider in the state, why we can't find at least some temporary beds for these kids so that they're not sitting in emergency departments. I mean, I've spent a day in emergency department and by four hours, I was ready to pull my hair out. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it just seems like if we have this acute problem, I mean, if we had a shortage of surgical suites, we'd be finding surgical suites somewhere. I, I, I'm not sure why we, these kids can't be moved to at least a slightly less traumatizing area of a hospital. Like I said, it may be simplistic, but that seems like something that we could do in the short term. I think the only way that I can comment to that, and that that is, yeah, it's not a simple issue. I think it's a very complex issue that many people are working on. Uh, I would say that the amount of staff that it takes to keep somebody safe, because that is often what I tell the kids are the goal when they come to the emergency room, like I'm here to keep you safe. Uh, and we will, like you will be assessed by a child psychiatrist every single day. Uh, it, it's not like the environment or milieu that you want to stay in for longer than four hours, but this is kind of what we have. The amount of staff that it takes, because you have to have 24-7 monitoring of somebody who's actively suicidal, uh, as well as the nursing staff that it's taking. Uh, and I will tell you, just so you are aware, I didn't want to highlight this because this is really focused on children's mental health. I think that's important. But it's not like the children with other medical complaints are stopping coming into the emergency room. And so... 
we have a situation right now in, in our ED where sometimes children, and I, I say this like the most respectfully, we do what we're doing our best. Children with a broken arm are waiting five hours in the waiting room because we physically don't have beds because we are boarding so many patients. And so in, in the other day, it was, a, it was a baby that was four weeks old that was waiting in the waiting room who you optimally do not want in a waiting room due to infection risks and such other things. So uh, I think it has to do with the, the number of staff it takes to adequately care for them and make sure they're safe. Uh, and that that staff is, is difficult uh, to one come by in multiple settings as Laurel highlighted, uh, especially on in our inpatient, but also certainly outside of the emergency department, which again, we're well resourced and set up to help do this, but we're supposed to be a transition point. And I, I agree with you. It's, it is a complex issue that I don't fully understand, but I do understand at least what it takes from an emergency department to keep somebody safe. But, but it seems like we're already staffing them. In the emergency department? Emergency department. And I guess you'd have to mirror that staff to then go upstairs uh, yeah. in the like, downstream. But, I, I know it's a, it just seems like, you know, I guess I'll leave it at that. I, I know it's complex, but this seems to be an emergency. Yeah, I, I think there are those of us who share that point of view. Uh, Representative Cordes, who actually works in the healthcare setting, uh, let me turn to you. And then we're, we're going to need to stop in just a few minutes uh, in order to take a break in order to then hear from our other witnesses. But Representative Cordes. So I, th I think you're, you're definitely raising a really good point, Representative Black. Um, and I'll just add to the question about staffing. It's not just numbers, but um, what the um, skills and qualifications are of the staff. Um, we might have empty beds in um, inpatient cardiology, but I'm a cardiology nurse. I'm not a pediatric nurse. I'm not a psychiatry nurse. Um, and we don't um, otherwise have the resources we would need to take care um, of those kids. So you're right, it's, a, it's definitely a complex issue, um, but I think definitely one worth worth looking at in the context of the, our hospital system statewide. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Donahue, do I see your hand? I, I'll, I'll just quickly mention another background informational piece. I know that um, UVMMC has been working on a redesign of the whole emergency department, which would include a a, a whole separate pediatric area, which would then also address mental health, because right now they don't have a separate pediatric emergency room. That, of course, got delayed some, I think, with COVID because they were close to putting their application in and, it, and it's been deferred. So, um, but the emergency room itself needs more physical capacity to be able to create that new design included a separate adult uh, mental health specific area and a separate uh, pediatric emergency area, but they don't and have- Southwestern it. is too, Southwestern Vermont. They already have their CON, they're moving ahead on it, um, but um, UVMMC has drafts, but not movement yet. Yeah, and I, I can't pretend that I understand all this. I do know in 2019, when I was in Philadelphia, a local crisis center closed down. Uh, and we, we anticipated that was going to happen and we got emergency authorization to build, uh, to expand our medical behavioral unit upstairs, which we, we don't currently have one at UVMMC, a medical behavioral unit for kids, but that would make sense according to our, you know, past volume, I can't comment on that, but the, uh, the ED actually was able to expand to six specific acute mental health beds within six months uh, from start to finish. Uh, with an emergency authorization, knowing that that crisis center was going to close. And thankfully we did, because from what I hear from them now, even that, even that six bed space is now overwhelmed uh, and their entire inpatient unit that's a med medical behavioral unit is also currently uh, full. Okay. Well, I think we need to stop here right at the moment. Uh, we have further witnesses to hear from, which we look forward to hearing from. I want to express uh, appreciation to 
uh, folks who've testified so far this morning. Uh, and I, I don't know, uh, I think some of the folks from the department perhaps will be available uh, throughout part of the morning at least, or through the morning, I hope someone from the department will be. Uh, and Dr. Polcini, I wanna say thank you, particularly for bringing your perspective uh, to our deliberations this morning. You are certainly also welcome to stay. I also understand that that's not likely given all the pressures on your work and your time. But, We're gonna uh, stick around. Okay, folks from uh, Dr. Ritu is going to stay around. Thank you, and Laurel. Uh, again, thank you. I, I think is as a small attempt to address some of our own health and wellness needs as legislators who spend really far too much time on Zoom and not enough time standing and doing other things. We are going to take, I'm going to suggest that we take a break from the screen and that we come back and start promptly at 10.30. I think uh, uh, Dr. Is it Capadia? I I'm, I'm, I'm apologize for mispronouncing names. Um, we've met before, Kapadia. but- Capadia. Oh, Capadia, thank you. Yeah, all the A's it, make the same sound. It is here to join us at right at 10.30. So let's take a, let's take a screen break and I'll be back a few minutes before 10.30 and then promptly we'll start at 10.30 again, because this is very important. Thank you.